God bless you all. This is your brother Melvin, and I'm here today with another uh, video for you today. Today I wanted to give you all a message. Um, three things I'd like to, to uh, talk to you about. Um, what I'd like to talk to you about are, uh, these are three things that the devil just cannot comprehend. So these are three things that we can use. These are three most effective tools that we can use to fend off the devil, to gain power over the devil. The first thing that the devil just cannot comprehend is compassion. What is compassion? Sympathy. Having love for other people. Wanting to see people win. Wanting to see people shine. Wanting to see people do what God has ordained them and tasked them out to do. Putting people in a position to where they can do the work of God. Putting people in a position where they can have a better life. You know, that's the greatest thing in life. And that's the best way in life to be successful, is to find out what your fellow brother and your fellow sister needs, and you tend to that need. You provide them that need. You'll find that life will be very happy for you. You'll be very happy in life, and life will be very fulfilling for you when you learn to find happiness through others. Happiness by find, seeing other people shine. See, a lot of us have created our lives to where our lives are just basically centered around us. So the only way anyone can get through to us or talk to us or be a part of our lives is they have to be a part of what we're doing. And if they're not a part of what we're doing because our lives are set up only for ourselves, then no one can get to us. No one can really have a relationship with us because we don't have the compassion to care about others. We're not sympathetic to other people, other people needing things. That's the reason why a lot of people won't befriend homeless people. Or people won't befriend people that are poor. Because if a person is poor, what does that say? They probably don't have a car. They probably don't have food. They probably don't have a place to stay. So that means they don't have anything to offer. So I'm giving, constantly giving to them. And they're not giving anything back. If they don't have a car, that means I have to give them a ride. If they don't have food, that means they're going to want some of my food. That means if they don't have anywhere to live, then they may be living in my house with me. And see, we don't like the idea of that anymore. We don't like the idea... Of, of really extending our hand to help others. We want to be helped. See, we want to feel, we want to feel the outpouring. We want to outpour. We want Jesus to invest in our lives and outpour himself in our lives. But we don't want to pour ourselves in anyone else's life. We just want the pouring to come in our life. We want everyone to feed into our lives and to support and champion our cause. But we don't want to really help anyone or, or, or be a part of what they have going. So we got to learn to deal with people with compassion. The devil, that's the quickest way to get the devil out of your life, is to learn to be more compassionate with people. Be more kind in your words. Just be more willing and more available to be there for people. Willing to take some time out of your busy life and your life that you've created that only centers around you and your immediate family. And be willing to step outside of that and invest yourself into someone else. Being able to impart everything that God has given you to someone else. Exercise that compassion. And you'll see a lot of things change in your life. And the devil will flee. He will, you'll find, he will find that he will, you won't be needing to flee from him. Because he's going to be fleeing from you. Because when someone can't understand something. They're usually not going to want it to be in front of them. And they're not going to want it, anything to do with something they can't comprehend. Because it's going to frustrate him. To know that he can't get in the midst of what you got going on because you're compassionate. You care about other people. Another thing he can't comprehend is brokenness. Now, see, we know the devil never reached a place of brokenness because that's what caused him to fall was his pride. The devil was the first competitor. The devil was the first person to compete. And because of that, he fell. He was created perfect and there was no iniquity found in him until he sinned. He wanted to be better than God. He wanted to be better than the very person that created him. See, the difference between him and Jesus was Jesus was the only begotten son. The devil was created. So that's another reason, another way we can defeat the devil is overcoming brokenness. Handling brokenness appropriately. Knowing that brokenness is a part of our spiritual growth and a part of our, our life that we're it's just a part of something that we're going to have to endure, but brokenness will build our character. Brokenness will be, uh, build your ability because what you'll find is you, you'll become in a place of being self-sacrificial. 
and when you learn to sacrifice yourself for the greater good of others, people will want to be a part of what you're doing, to see that you're willing to give up your life for the advancement and the betterment of others. People will, will, will tend to respect that and want to be a part of that. And another thing um, that the devil can't comprehend is self-sacrifice. Being self-sacrificial, extending yourself to those that, that need help. Being available to pray for those that are in need of prayer. Being available for those who need things that you have. You know, we, we I just don't know how some people are unable to make this connection, but many people are in positions where they have a lot of money, they have a lot of resources. God has blessed them with a lot of things. And they only have those things for themselves. See, the misconception of, of people in this present day and age is people tend to look at wealth at what someone has, what they've acquired. So if I have a lot of cars, I'm wealthy. If I have a big house, I'm wealthy. What we should, how we really should be looking at wealth is how well they're using the things to help other people. That's the real wealth. Because that's generating wealth because not only does that come back to you, but you're helping others. You know, no one gets wealthy off of investing in themselves. You get wealthy off of investing in other things. Putting your money, putting your time, putting your attention in the other things. So we look at wealth as what someone has acquired and what someone has had. You know, that uh, buying into perception. Instead of looking at what people are doing with the things that God has blessed them with and how they're strengthening the body of Christ in the midst of these things. And um, I wanted to uh, give you all some scriptures that that uh, spoke to me. And uh, we're going to go to 1 Peter. I believe it is. No, actually we're going to go to 2 Peter. I'm sorry. We're going to go to 2 Peter. And we're going to start at... Let me get that first. 2 Peter. And we are going to start at verse 4. And we're going to read to verse 7. So 2 Peter chapter 4, verse 7 says, Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And verse 5 says, listen to what he says. He says, And besides this, giving all diligence... And adding to your faith virtue, and to your virtue knowledge. Verse 6 says, And to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness. And verse 7 says, And to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. So you see all of these things lead to another thing. It's all in steps. You know, so it starts off that, uh, you know, when we receive these great and precious promises, you know, we escape the world. We escape all that that is in the world through lust. Now, what is lust? We, we tend to always uh, look at sexual lust. But lust is just the strong desire for something. So, before we met God, we all had a strong desire for something. Whether it was a strong desire to be loved, a strong desire to be appreciated, a strong desi desire to be needed by someone. We all had a strong desire to do something in God. Something in this life. And it was apart from God. But when we find Christ, that we, we remove lust because we know the Spirit, the Holy Spirit doesn't lust. But we have a strong desire and a zeal to serve God. And verse 5, it says, we're giving all diligence. Add to your faith virtue and to your, and to your virtue knowledge. So see, after virtue comes knowledge. Once you receive the virtue, you receive knowledge. Now you're making sound decisions. You're, you're of a sound mind because you're adhering to the sound doctrine. So you're making the right decisions. Your family comes before everything. You're willing to sacrifice yourself and sacrifice the things that you have and sacrifice and give your blessings that God has given to you and give that to your family. You're willing to give identity to your wife. You're willing to give identity to your children. You're willing to give identity to those at your church that need it. You're willing to, to, to overextend yourself for the advancement of the kingdom. And then it says, and to knowledge temperaments. So when we have knowledge of making the right decisions and making the right sound decisions, 
we can exercise temperance. Now, temperance is self-control. So when I'm in the right frame of mind and the Holy Spirit is guiding and leading my life, I have the self-control to refrain from cussing someone out when they make me angry. I refrain from going out and getting drunk when I get a bill that I can't pay. I refrain from going to get buy black and miles or going to buy a blunt to smoke when my, me and my wife argue or there's some type of issue in my life that God is not dealing with right then and there. I've exercised this self. I have the temperaments now, which is one of the uh, fruits of the Spirit, as it speaks of in Galatians 5. I have temperaments now, which is the self-control to endure whatever it is that I'm dealing with. And if it's something that is going to be a testimony in my life, meaning something that I have to bear with my cross, then I'm just willing to say, as Paul said, as it says in 2 Corinthians, that uh, Paul was told, my grace is made... Your um, your strength is made. What does it say? It says uh, your grace. Your my grace is sufficient for thee. This is what Paul was told. He said, "My grace is made sufficient for thee, and my strength is made per perfect in weakness." So no, even in your times of being weak, the grace is sufficient. God's grace and His mercy is sufficient. Temperaments will help you understand those things and get those and, and keep those type of things in your spirit. And then it says, and to temperaments, patience. So if you have the self-control to withstand and do and, and you know withhold from acting out in a way that the Bible condemns, and you're able to uh, not let the works of the flesh allow you to make decisions outside of God, then you, you're exercising patience. So you have the patience to know that it may not be time for something to happen yet. Or it may not be time for God to reveal something to you that you want him to reveal right at that moment. You have the patience of knowing I'm still going to, to pray. I'm still going to seek out brothers that pray because it says the fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. So I'm still going to continue to give God the honor and praise in my life and talk to God and give him the proper time and attention and invite him in my life. And still desire and strive for that that deep relationship with him through prayer and fasting and reading the word of God. And I'm patient because I know that he's going to fix it. And then it says into patience, godliness. So when we learn to be patient and we learn to withstand whatever trials and tribulations that we're going through, then we, we, we're, we're exercising the characteristics of Jesus. We're being more like Jesus. So... Instead of being infectious to people in a bad way, we're actually being contagious to people in a good way. To where people are seeing God's love, they're seeing God's attributes, they're seeing his characteristics, they're seeing his likeness. And we're more, we're more, they're more willing and their heart may be more open to receive what we're, what we're doing and what God is doing through us. And then it says, and to godliness, brotherly kindness. Brotherly kindness is the missing component in this world at present. Brothers are not kind to each other anymore. Brothers don't consult each other anymore. We, we've been taught now to just go into our house, shut our door, and deal with our problems on our own. We don't sit down and consult each other. A lot of young brothers, they don't want to go in church and and have a pastor get have a pastor show them how to lead, have an elder show them how to lead. So they go and get on Facebook or they go and get on YouTube and they become self righteous and they create this own little world where they can talk to people and they can control the environment because we know we're going into a church. We lose control in a lot of ways. So we don't want to give anyone authority over our lives because a lot of people have abused that authority. Maybe our parents neglected us, they weren't there for us, our parents were liars, our parents didn't really live out the word, the will of God, and now that we've opened up the word and, and read that, we realize that our parents fell short. And they didn't lead, they didn't live a Christ-centered life that was beneficial to us really living out a life for God. So what we do is we go on this quest to find everything wrong and find faults in everything instead of realizing that the like I said in my last video, the kingdom of God is, is at hand and that people are out here in need of salvation. So we need to exercise that brotherly kindness that's needed 
so the body of Christ can advance, so men can, can, can restore those relationships back with their families and their wives and their children. And then it says, and brotherly kindness is charity. Charity is the agape love. That sacrificial love goes back to that again. Willing to give up things you have to see someone else have. That's what it's all about. I want to leave you all with a thought um, in my closing. And I want you all to think about this. And I want you all to examine yourselves with this, with this, uh, what I want to leave you with. Don't spend so much time chasing what you want that you lose what you have. Don't spend so much time at work chasing after money, chasing after cars, chasing after purpose that you lose your salvation or you lose your relationship with God. Don't go chasing after an identity in this world and don't go yoke yourself up with organizations and programs that are godless and lose your salvation. Don't chase after things and lose what you have because you already have salvation. You've already received Jesus in your life. But don't lose the relationship. Don't deactivate your Holy Ghost because you're on a mission to get things in life that you want. Don't let your wants become more important than your needs and more importantly than your salvation that you have. This is your brother Melvin and God bless you all and keep seeking Jesus Christ with your life.